1995, I was 20 years old, and I had taken a semester off from college because my father was deep into the second year of an unnamed, untreatable illness. Seemingly out of nowhere, two years earlier, his body had started to swell. So I remember that he had been this very lean, fit 44-year-old, and suddenly this gut appeared. And then the swelling expanded, stretching down his limbs, eventually filling his face, hands, and feet. And he was exhausted. His skin turned gray, and soon he was having trouble walking. So what the doctors could tell us was that my father was experiencing something called massive ascites. It's basically when a fluid called chyle that's made up of lymph and emulsified fats spills into the body cavity and settles. So as a result, my father wasn't absorbing nutrients. In fact, no matter how big and swollen his body got, he was actually starving. And the thing about massive ascites is that it is almost always caused by something else. It doesn't just happen spontaneously in the human body. It's a symptom. But my father didn't have any of those something else's. He had no failing or diseased organs, no blood abnormalities or blood clots, no cancers of any kind, and his condition was worsening. So it was around this time that I would say each of us sort of began embracing our own survival techniques. My father was sleeping a lot. My sister was crying a lot. I was smoking way too much. And my mother started to chase the mailman. I know, like most male people, our mailman didn't require chasing. He actually made his way at some point over to our house. But every day my mother would wake up, she would help my father go to the bathroom, and then she'd give him his breakfast, which was an IV drip she'd attach to a port in his groin that he wouldn't actually digest. And then once he had fallen back to sleep, she would get in her car in our middle-class suburban Ohio neighborhood, and she'd drive up and down the blocks seeking out her mail. And once in a while, I'd go with her, she'd invite me, and I noticed that the mailman had actually started keeping her mail in like a different pocket of the pouch so that he could like give it to her exactly when she wanted it really easily. He didn't have to look around for it. And I noticed on the days that he made it to the house and got the mail in the mailbox, she was really disappointed because it wasn't really about the mail. It was about power and control, her power and control, something she had lost since my father had become sick and no one from doctor's hospital to the Cleveland Clinic to the Mayo Clinic to Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston had any idea what he had and no one knew how to treat it. So she had no control over my dad, but the moment in her day when she got her mail, that she had covered. My father was a physician. Every time he had a patient with a particularly scary diagnosis, he'd always say something like, look, it's good, it's something we've seen before. It's something someone for some period of time has survived. In other words, there's hope. But two years in, he didn't have that kind of comfort. His illness didn't have survivors or even a death toll because it didn't even have a name. A name contains a thing, it gives it a body. Like, my father's name was William, and everyone called him Billy, so that's Billy Linder. He has two daughters, and he's been married to their mother for 25 years. He grew up in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, but has lived in Columbus, Ohio for most of his life. He, lives, he likes classic rock, Ohio State football, thunderstorms, and dogs. He's the kind of dad that talks to you and your friends about things you care about without judgment. He's the kind of man that has a standing room only funeral. Billy was. But his illness, which we had taken to calling the illness, refused to be similarly contained. But we were willing to try everything from exotic oils to magic beans. We even tried a newfangled technology called the internet that actually let you consult on cases with doctors in faraway places like Japan. But there was one person who had an answer. It was my great Aunt Joni. So unfortunately, Aunt Joni didn't have any fancy medical credentials, or we might have heard her sooner. What she did have, however, was just like a little bit of lipstick on her teeth. But um, 
she's wonderful. She's the aunt that comes to everyone's bar and bat mitzvahs and weddings and hospital bedsides. And she had been practically jumping up and down with her deceased husband Nathan's medical chart ever since my father had first shown signs of the illness. She had driven from Yonkers to Bethesda multiple times to collect it from the National Institutes of Health, where Nathan had been a patient in the 1960s. And when someone finally got around to looking at that 1961 chart, they saw phrases like lymphatic edema of unknown origin and massive ascites. And we realized that this illness had been seen before, 30 years previous in my father's uncle. So this led to renewed questions about Nathan's mother. So my great-grandmother, May, had died of something that everyone collectively called uh, I don't know. So when we got her chart, of course, we saw phrases like abdominal swelling and lymphatic edema, and bells went off. Now, I'm not, you know, there's a lot of reasons why we didn't make this connection between these illnesses sooner. But the truth was my great-grandmother was 56 when she died in the 1950s. Her son was 34 when he died in the 1960s. And I really feel like diagnoses of I don't know seemed like they were par for the course for that time, or seemed like they could be. And the other thing is, what Aunt Joni was suggesting was really scary and frankly impossible. But the closer we looked, we started to realize that although it seemed impossible, in fact, the remarkable was happening. It was genetics. So let's talk about genetics. Genetics, as we are told in fifth grade science class, dictate the blueprints our bodies follow to mold the matter that creates us. From the way our synapses fire to the timber of our voices, our genes made up of countless proteins make us who we are. And they mutate. In fact, mutations are how we grow and change every day. And mistakes are bound to happen. So sometimes it's environmentally related. Think, you know, sunbathing and skin cancer. And other times it's just a bad copy job. The good news is that it's very rare that a mutation will lead to a deadly illness, especially one that passes intergenerationally. The bad news is that is exactly what it seemed like great grandma May's mutation was doing. We were starting to realize it looked like a one in a billion mutation. So this team of scientists, led by Dr. Christine Seidman of Harvard's Seidman Lab, swooped in and began this exhaustive study of our illness and the gene that she now believed was causing it. And as information started coming back to us, the first news we got wasn't good. The gene was X-linked, they told us, on the X chromosome. So now men pass male children Y chromosomes. My sister and I were not male children. The gene we had inherited from our father was his ex. So it was bad news, it was really bad news. But for science, it was actually something of a lightning strike or something even rarer. My family was a founder population, a group of people exhibiting the symptoms of an entirely new mutation, and a founder mutation because it is the first of its kind. And this is happening just at the cusp of a new science finally able to understand it, a science that today we call genomics. So now genomic sciences are looking deep into the history of genes to find founder populations and founder mutations for all sorts of genetic conditions in the hopes of deepening our understanding of the exhibited complications. Recently, huge advances have been made in, in finding the founder populations for forms of autism and various cancers. You've probably heard of a, of a genetic condition called cystic fibrosis, or CF. So the gene for CF is believed to have mutated 52,000 years ago in Europe. Today, 100,000 people are affected by this gene for CF. That means that every single one of those 100,000 people, plus everybody carrying the CF gene, which is hundreds of thousands more, share that single common European ancestor. So now, ever since CF first mutated, there have been 2,625 generations. My great-grandmother's mutation, our illness, has had four. So our gene actually asks the opposite question to every other genomic quest. It's not, where has our little gene come from, but where will this little gene of ours go? For the first time, 
in what is probably the first time in human medical history, we are able to witness a founder effect from its inception and can perhaps stop this disease at generation four rather than at generation 2,625. So my sister's twins were born using in vitro fertilization with genetic selection in order to weed out the gene in my niece and nephew. Another cousin recently got lucky when she learned that her two children, who were born before we understood this genetic connection, were randomly spared the gene. My husband and I have tried to have children, but learned that the vascular degeneration that I'm living with because of the gene is too dangerous to attempt pregnancy. So, so far, there is no fifth generation with this gene. But there are still eight people living with the mutation, which is believed to be on one of four genes. Now, the people who believe it are some of the very best genetic researchers in the world. But we have a really big problem. So far, they haven't been able to prove it, and they've tried. Now, proof when it comes to science is a very complicated thing. So first, they mutated our gene in a mouse. The idea being that when that mouse got sick, it would prove that this gene was the problem. Unfortunately, our mouse died before he got sick. So they tried something called exome mapping. Now, exome mapping is where you lay out every single protein sequence in every gene in more than one person in a population and compare them side by side. If you imagine doing that with two CF patients who are separated by thousands of generations, their gene pools are vastly different, and it's a little bit easier to hone in on the hotspots where their genes overlap. But if you can imagine for my family's second cousin exome maps, which is the very best we can do, the overlap in our gene pools was just too significant. Plus, there have only ever been 14 known carriers, rather than the hundreds of thousands. So we're definitely facing a big problem. I've been told that once, our do once these doctors are able to prove it and they can publish, it will open a much bigger dialogue in the medical and scientific communities. It can increase resources, it can increase funding, and you know, the thing that everybody with a rare disease knows is you're constantly fighting for attention and resources. And the biggest reason of all is because we need it to save a couple of lives, including my sisters, including my cousins, and including my own. My sister and I have been called ticking time bombs. The vascular degeneration we are living with is causing collateral pathways to, be, to reroute our blood into, through things called varicosities or varices or vascular aneurysms that could burst internally at any moment. So it's also believed to be directly linked to lymphedema and potentially massive ascites. Recently, they were able to mutate another mouse, and we're going to see what happens with that. Um, we're also hoping that through platforms like this, maybe we can find another family with the gene, and if not a human one, maybe there's something else in the animal kingdom. Then we're also looking into brand new genomic technologies that are expanding at this explosive rate, and maybe someone can come in and work with our team at the Seidman Lab to help us prove this gene, name our illness, and potentially cure it. After my father died, his brother, my uncle Norman, and then my great aunt Norma, also filled with lymph and slowly died. But my grandmother is 90 and living with the gene. There are other cousins in their 50s and 60s who live virtually symptom-free. But some of us might be facing imminent death. Or we might live long and happy lives. And either scenario could be true because like anything four generations deep, without official death tolls or official survivors, without a name, no one knows for sure. I've known since I was 22 that I would do whatever I could to make sure that my family represented the first founder population that did not let its gene live beyond its founders. Meanwhile, every day I take an allergy pill that one doctor once suggested might keep my gene from expressing. I drink a kale smoothie in the hopes that its anti-inflammatory properties will you know, keep my vascular system from breaking down further. And I call them my Dumbo feathers, that talisman that Disney elephant held because he believed it would make him fly. Because if I believe in these rituals hard enough, then maybe they will work. I might just be chasing the mailman, but it's better than sitting at home waiting for the mail. Thank you.